Hey guys, welcome back to another coffee and a chat. And somehow, all of a sudden, <laughs> yeah, maybe that's more stable. <laughs> yeah, things around me usually aren't stable. <laughs> Don't know why. Hmm. Anyway, I hope you guys are having a great day. The guys are out doing some stuff and the house is kind of quiet. I don't know how long it's going to stay that way. So I thought, you know what? I'll just take a few minutes here and, and um, I need a break anyway. Back is not hurting so much now, but it keeps getting stiff on me. And the, I think a lot of it is because the temperature is going down outside and getting colder. So I just kind of needed to take a little break anyway. I'm trying to get caught up from everything that I got behind on for you know, a couple of days of not being really very active. Uh, yeah, sitting and laying around because if you ever throw your back out, you know it's no joke. Okay, so today, uh, one of the things that I haven't shared yet, but have been wanting to, maybe today's the day, is uh, kind of, I guess, maybe the beginning of my testimony. Um yeah, maybe that's what it is. <laughs> we'll see. You tell me. Okay, so I, I've told you guys in the past, those of you that watch the channel and have been watching all the videos, you, you will know that I grew up in a Christian home and that even when my mom was pregnant with me, you know, she sang hymns to me and she read scripture to me and she talked to me. And so, you know, I, uh, I don't have one of those testimonies of, you know, how you know, I was going through life and, and, you know, and then I discovered God, I, you know, didn't even believe in him or anything. I've always believed in God. I've always believed that Jesus is the son of God. I've always believed that he's our savior. I just didn't necessarily understand how that, uh, pertained to me. I think that as a little kid, in a lot of ways, I just kind of thought I was born a Christian or a follower of Jesus. I like that way better than, yeah. And, um, to understand that I needed to make a personal decision. You know, my, my life wasn't like other people's lives. Now I'm talking about being a really, really little kid and probably recognizing that my life wasn't like a lot of other people's when they were sharing testimonies came later in life. But there to begin with, I, um, you know, I've told you before, I was a very unusual child, I think. I don't think I was really typical. And I would often, you know, where other kids might be daydreaming about, I don't know, going camping, building a tent, climbing a mountain, running a race, being a doctor when they grow up. I have no idea. Most of my daydreaming was really spent thinking about God and, and you know, and trying to figure things out, even as a very little child. And so I was, this would be the summer that I was five and well, coming towards the end of the summer and I was getting ready to go into kindergarten. And so I'd say it probably was probably about August. And I, in my daydreaming and thinking about God and all, I began to just kind of, you know, because I would pray during those times because I just talked to God and I'd tell him, you know, that I just thought it was so great that I was just automatically, you know, saved, that I was automatically a Christian. And, you know, and and I do believe that God was questioning my heart, was asking me, why, why do you think that? What, what makes you automatically, you know, a Christian? Because I began to give my reasons, you know, well, I was born into a Christian home. I remember thinking that was one because I was an editor, you know, and, and our whole family be <laughs> believes in God. That must do it. And I live in America. And I even remember, and I speak English <laughs> and I go to First Baptist Church and, and, and I had, you know, all these really silly things that I believed made me saved. And I just kind of went about my life. Well, that next Sunday when we went to church now, I don't even, I know we had a nursery at our church, but we didn't have, I don't think children's church or anything like that. I don't even know if there was such a thing when I was a kid. I've got to adjust positions here a minute. Okay. 
getting real stiff there. Okay, so I don't, I just know that my parents always kept us in church with them. And we were supposed to, um, you know, sit there and behave. And they taught us from a very young age how to be quiet and, you know, and, and not fidget around a lot. Don't talk, don't make noise. You know, we learned to sit there to be seen and not heard and behave ourselves and not draw attention to ourselves and just behave. Now, my dad was the, the music director and choir director. And so we usually sat on the front pew or the second pew so that my dad and uh, my mom sang in the choir. So like Sunday mornings, they both would be on the platform and my older brother would be in charge of keeping us in line. And then when they would dismiss the choir before the preaching, my dad and mom would come down and sit with us. And then on Sunday nights, because my dad was leading singing, that's when we'd usually sit in the second pew so that it was real easy for my dad to come join us. And so we were always sitting up front. So it was very important that we behave ourselves. And so I usually would sit there and I'd sit next to my dad and I'd take his big old hand and lay it in my lap and play with the veins on the back of his of his hand and and twist his wedding ring around and because it was always his left hand. And um, and I would just I could just keep my myself under control for a long time, probably for hours, just playing with my dad's hand, looking at all the different things, all the little, you know, I'd turn it and he'd just sit there and let me do it. You know, I'd turn his hand and look at both sides and, you know, and, and look down real close at how the hairs would grow out on it. And I just was so fascinated with my, my father's hand. But here's the thing. Just because a child is sitting there and maybe they're you know, playing with something or whatever does not mean they're not paying attention. So here I am, this five-year-old, and I was paying attention. And our pastor at the time was Dr. Anderson, and, and he was preaching on salvation. And he was telling us that everybody was a sinner, that everybody did bad things, and we all needed forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And, you know, and he talked how G about how Jesus was perfect without sin. He is God and that he died in our place on the cross for our sins. And so we need to receive him in order, you know, to be saved, that we needed to, you know, acknowledge that we were a sinner and ask for forgiveness. And, you know, and he went through all this, all this stuff that we're supposed to do. And then, you know, and so that's fine. You know, I'm listening to that thinking, yeah, but not me. <laughs> Cause I'm automatically in. And then he said, now some people think that they're just, that they are saved because, you know, they live in America. They think that makes them a Christian because we're a Christian nation. That doesn't make you a Christian. I was like, what? Some people think because they go to a certain church, it doesn't matter what church you go to. It doesn't make you a Christian. I'm like, huh? It doesn't even matter what family you're in. Maybe you're in a family that's a Christian family and everybody believes in God, but that doesn't mean you're automatically saved. And so he just kind of one by one, I think he might've even mentioned speaking English, but he went down my line of the things that I was believing made me automatically in, born into the, born into the family of God by birth and and he said they were none of those would do it. And that I was still a dirty, rotten sinner. <laughs> and I didn't like it. I didn't like what he had to say. It really bothered me. And so when we went home that that day, we had lunch and you know, and and after lunch, we were supposed to lay down for naps. Or my younger brother and I were our older brother didn't have to. He was quite a bit older. But my younger brother and I were supposed to lay down for a nap. And I went and told my mom that, you know, that, you know, I, I know Dr. Anderson said, Anderson said this, this, and this, but, but that's not me. And she goes, Oh, it's not. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm not a sinner. I don't, I can, I, you know, I can not do bad things so I can just not sin. And she said, Angie, you cannot go one day without sinning. And I was like, yes, I can. And she goes, okay then, then let's, let's try that. See if you can go the rest of today without sinning. And we'll talk about it when you get ready to go to bed tonight. So I was like, okay. And so I went and took my nap and I got up and I don't know, probably 
picked on my little brother a little or, you know, stole something from him, you know, one of his toys or I, you know, whatever five-year-olds do, but I acted up. And so when I got ready for bed, you know, my mom was like, so how'd you do on not sinning? And I was like, um, well, you know, I knew I'd done wrong. And not, not so good. I, ne I need to be able to a fresh start. So when I get up in the morning so I can focus on it all day. See, I already knew I'd messed up in the morning. So I think that just kind of made me mess up the rest of the day. But if I start in the morning, I'll be fine. So she's like, okay. So every day through that week, you know, the first part of the week, I would wake up in the morning and I was going to live a sin-free day. And sometimes I'd even try to tell my mom, oh yeah, I didn't sin today, even though I knew I had. I didn't sin today. And then she goes, oh yeah, but what about when I asked you that and then you lied to me and remember that thing today? Yeah. So there were, you know, she she just pointed out for me. So by the end of the week, by Friday or Saturday, I finally had to concede that I, I was a sinner and I couldn't just not sin. So I couldn't be sin free and get into heaven that way. And so I, I went to my mom and, and I know my parents knew that I was, you know, struggling with all of this and, uh, and I'm sure they were praying for me. But I went to my mom and I was, you know, and I told her, I, I know that I need Jesus and I'm going to have to admit that I'm a sinner. And I, I didn't like that part, but it was true. And I wanted to ask him in my heart, would she help me? And so she was like, yeah, no problem. And so we stopped right there in the living room and knelt down by the couch. And my mom prayed with me and, you know, kind of did a little repeat after me prayer. And I, I remember I was trying to get all the words right. Because I didn't want to mess this up. And because I really wanted to be saved. I really wanted to to be born again. I really wanted to, you know, all the things that they would say. I wanted to be, you know, part of God's family. I wanted to be saved. And I didn't want to be lost. And and probably because our church was not afraid to talk about hell. And that, that may have been one of my greatest motivators was that I, I didn't want want to go to hell. I wanted to go to heaven. I was five years old. You know, how much did I understand? Probably a lot more than you would think. But anyway, that, you know, in, in a few weeks, and I went forward at church on Sunday and, and, you know, and told everybody what I'd done, made my public profession of faith. I did everything that I was told I should do. So I went to kindergarten and the kindergarten was at our church. Sarah Morrison, I think that was our kindergartner's garden teacher's name. She was an older lady. She was like a, a wonderful grandma. And so um, we would each day, we would, at one point, we would go down to the gym, the church gym, and we would play games and stuff. And then we'd come back to the kindergarten room and we would have apple juice and, a, and a, a, like a vanilla wafer. I think we had those every single day. That was our little snack. And then they would turn the lights off and everybody put their head down on their desk and they'd take a little nap. Or at least that's what we were supposed to be doing. That's what everybody else did because they were wore out from playing. But me, no. There was something else going on with me. And so the, the teacher, she kept, she'd hear me talking. Just kind of like little whispers and stuff. And at first she was trying to figure out who I was talking to. And so she, she moved me from where I was so that I was sitting by myself and then, you know, told me to put my head down and, and, you know, and then she went back to her desk and she could hear me talking again, but there wasn't even anybody there to be talking to. So she's like, what is going on? And so, you know, so she was like, Angie, you need to, you need, you need to be quiet. And I'm like, oh, okay. But pretty soon she'd hear me talking. And so she kind of let it go that day. And the next day, same thing happened. And so she finally, I don't know how many days she let it go. Not very many, two or three max. And then she, she came over and, and she sat down next to me. And she said, Angie, you never take the nap 
and you're always talking to somebody. Now, who are you talking to? Because I've moved you away from the other kids, so there's no kids here. Who are you talking to? And I was like, well, I'm talking to Jesus. And she was like, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't know that. So what are you talking to Jesus about? And I said, well, this summer, I found out that I'm a sinner. Probably said a dirty, rotten sinner. because, Yeah, I, I played that one up because I felt pretty bad about being a sinner. I didn't want to sugarcoat it. And, you know, and I, I said that, you know, I tried to, to get at least one day of my life with no sin, but I couldn't do it. I ended up sinning every single day. I did something. And so finally, you know, I told my mom that I knew I needed Jesus. I told her about Dr. Anderson's sermon and how he, you know, all these things that I thought made me saved and how he said, and I hadn't told him. But he knew what I had been thinking and that none of those things would save me. And, you know, and I needed to get this thing right. And so she was, I remember her really, I, I thought she's almost looking at me like I'm an adult having this conversation with her instead of like a weird little kid. And, you know, and so I said, and so she goes, you know, and I told her that my mom and I had prayed in the living room and I'd asked Jesus into my heart and then I'd gone forward at church. And she goes, yeah, I remember when you went forward at church and told us all you'd given your heart to Jesus. And she goes, so what does that have to do with right now with you talking? And I said, well, I keep trying to remember what my mom told me I needed to say when I prayed to ask him into my heart. So I'm, I'm trying to ask him into my heart again. And she said, well, you don't, you don't have to ask him into your heart again. You only have to do it once. Why, you know, why do you think, you know, so, and I said, but what if I said it wrong? And she said, said what wrong? And I'm like that prayer. What if I left something out? What if I forgot to say something? What if I didn't say it right? And, and so then she's like, okay, now I understand what's going on. See, I thought that there was this magic prayer written down in the Bible and that if you said it just right and really meant it in your heart, see, that was my five-year-old understanding of what they were talking about, that then I'd, I'd be saved. But if I got it wrong and I couldn't afford to get it wrong. So, I mean, I was already five years old, I was already getting to be an old lady and wasting, wasting time no time to spare. So they tried, my kindergarten teacher talked to me, my pastor talked to me, my mom and dad talked to me, and they all tried to put that at ease. And we finally got me to a point where it was okay. But I say it's the beginning of my story, because if your life is like mine, it's not like I just had this one moment, gave my heart to Jesus, and that's it. It has been a journey. So when I was 14, I, I don't even remember what all was going on, but I hit a point where I really began to question my salvation and if I was really saved. I thought I didn't have a testimony like anybody else's. I hadn't been out in the world doing drugs or, or drinking or, you know, I would hear lots of interesting testimonies, usually from adults, but I didn't have that kind of a story. I grew up in a Christian home and I hadn't done, I'd done bad things, but nothing like what, you know, what other people were talking about they'd done. And, and, you know, and, and I just began to question a lot. And I really believe that at that point in my life, that God was, was putting a conviction in me about really growing spiritually, because that was a lot of what was missing as I just was kind of trying to exist. And, and my relationship with the church was my Christian walk. And God does, he wants us to have a relationship with him. So it can't, it's not just about the church and the church can't replace him. And so I ended up, um, I'm trying to think what the guy's name was. There was an evangelist that came to the city where we lived. I'll think of it later. I'll think of it in the middle of the night tonight. I'll sit up in bed and say this guy's name out. It'll wake Marvin up and he'll be like, what? Oh, I almost thought of the guy's name. Anyway, 
doesn't matter, I guess. This evangelist, not Billy Graham. I wouldn't forget his name. But this evangelist came to our, our city and he did um, a big crusade. And so, um, you know, my mom and dad knew I was really struggling and, uh, and questioning my faith and, and my salvation and everything. And, and so my dad had asked me, did I want to, to go? He was going to go. And, and I said, yeah, I'll go with you. And, and so, of course, because God is so wonderful and he knows each one of us intimately and he knows what we need. So that evening, the evangelist preached on the very thing I was struggling with. And, you know, and he offered that, you know, that if you're not sure, you can, you can be sure now. And so, you know, he gave the invitation and I stood up and, and looked at my dad, you know, I'm like, I'm going. And he goes, do you want me to go with you? And I'm like, no, I can do this. And so I, I went forward at that, you know, and, and, and it, it was life changing for me that, changed a lot in me. And again, it was at the end of summer. And when I went to school, I went in there and hit the ninth grade with both feet running to tell everybody about Jesus. And I um, was reading my Bible more persistently. I was um, being more faithful with my prayer journal. And I just really began to build a relationship with Jesus and started having time alone with him. Our youth pastor, who was amazing, um, his wife was my Sunday school teacher. And she, every time that we went up a grade, she went up the grade with us girls. And so she was our Sunday school teacher all the way through, through um, junior high and high school. Uh, Nancy was our teacher. And so we, um, you know, they, they were working with me. Everybody was trying to help me and disciple me. And I remember um, that they, my youth pastor and his wife had bought me um, a, a Bible study journal that, and I'd never had something like that. So it was, you know, it'll ask you questions and give you things to think about and all. And, and that really helped me a lot. So I was really actively involved in building this relationship. And there's other parts of my testimony that come between these things, but these were like big pivotal, pivotal moments. And then another one was when I was, when I was 28, 29, somewhere in there. And I had just really, um, I I've given some of that testimony before, but I really had just fallen away in my faith. And I was in a very troubled marriage and, that was causing me some doubts and grief and there just was a lot going on and I just started like I don't know if it even you know I, I started going to this doubting of does it even pay off to be a Christian you know because this you know the things that were going on were so overwhelming for me and so um and there just didn't seem you know as much as I prayed things didn't seem to get better and I just began to doubt, but then that's the one, if you look back, um, I can't remember what I, what I called that one. Oh, I think it's, she's in the gutter or something like that. Um, because that's the one where, where God showed me exactly where I'd, I would have been in life had I never known him. And so, um, that one was another moment in my life that took me so much deeper with God. And then, um, in 2007, when I went through the darkest time of my life and almost didn't make it, that was a huge moment that changed so much in my life. That one probably changed me more than anything and drew me into a deeper intimacy than I've ever known, you know, had ever known up to that point with God. And, and then I ended up going through my divorce six years after that and was pretty sure that I was just going to be alone and I, you know, and just have a very small handful of friends and just exist until the day I died that, that there was no place for me anymore. Um, a lot of people had turned their back on me, uh, because they were told things that weren't true about me, but for whatever reason, people love to, they love the gossip. 
and they love the drama and they love to believe that those shocking things are true even when they're not and if they just paid half a half a bit of attention they would have seen that it wasn't even possible it didn't even make sense so um if you wanted to find me during that time go to church i was going to mul multiple churches and every time the doors were open and i hung out with <laughs> With one woman in her 70s, another one in her 80s, I hung out with my mom and dad, you know, I and I had a very small handful of friends that, that I hung out with, and um, it just wasn't really as exciting of, um, you know, as what the gossip made it seem like it was, but that was a devastating time to go through, but yet, see, out of that, Especially when I finally said, look, because there were, I was meeting men, oh yeah, um, at church, but they all seemed to have a different idea about dating than what I did. Uh, we were not on the same page and it was not a good situation. It was not okay with me. And, you know, and it didn't take me long to figure out this is not the, the direction I want to go. This is not who I want to be. And so I, you know, I made some choices and, you know, and told the Lord that, you know, if this is all there is out there, I'm not interested. And so unless you have somebody that is a godly man, that's going to be a godly husband that you want me to marry and, and you bring them to me and set them down in front of me and say, here, this one, marry him. Unless you do that, I'm done. And it'll just be you and me. I'll be so lonely, I'm sure. But that's okay. I, I'll make the sacrifice because I would rather be alone than in that kind of a situation. So I, you don't want to come out of one bad situation just to go into another. Not, yeah, that definition of insanity doing the same thing over and over again expecting different results yeah that wasn't me i wasn't gonna do it and so um and then eventually god and not a super long time in fact god brought marvin into my life and definitely being married to marvin has been another life changing uh event for me spiritually and god has worked through it so that's kind of where all of that went, but, um, and that's just kind of in a 27 and a half minute nutshell. <laughs> ah, it's hard to get it down really little, but that's kind of the journey. You know, those are just highlight moments of the journey. And I think most of us with our walk with Christ, we do have, you know, these highlight moments that we go through that take us to the next level that take us to the next thing, you know, with God and in how he prepares us and gets us ready. So I wanted to share that with you. And I would love to hear from some of you if you've had that same kind of experience that God kind of takes you through these different things. It starts here, but then he keeps taking you through things, bringing you closer to him and deepening your walk with him. And, and then the other thing is I've met so many people that have put their faith in having said the right words for a sinner's prayer so they know they're okay, even though nothing ever changed in life. You guys, I, I can tell you from going through the word all these years. First off, see this? This is one of my Bibles. In this Bible... There is no, say these words and you'll be saved. It's not how it works. In fact, every time somebody gives their heart to Jesus in the Bible, they say something different. And when they ask Jesus about being saved, he'll say something different to them. But yet it's still the same. He tells the rich man to sell everything he's got and come follow him. He tells the uh, Nicodemus that he's got to be born again, that you know, that go get born over again. And he tells each one of them, basically what he tells them is whatever they're putting their faith in to be what's, what makes them okay and saved or right with God, let's say that. Whatever they're putting their faith in that they believe is making them right with God, get rid of it 
and put your faith in Jesus. So I couldn't put my faith in speaking English anymore, and I'm not really good at speaking English anyway, but I blame my dad because I grew up speaking a little bit of German too because his family spoke German. So I always said that confused me. Then uh, being an American, I had to give up my faith in that. Being being an Edgar in the Edgar family, had to give up my faith in that. I had to give up my faith in the church I went to. That none of those things were going to save me, but only Jesus. And does it take any big thing? Look, the thief on the cross, this is one of my favorite ones, is when Jesus was crucified, there, was, there were two criminals on either side of him. One mocked him and made fun of him along with others in the crowd. But the other one was like, no, surely he is the son of God. And his sinner's prayer was, was here was his sinner's prayer. Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Now, Jesus didn't say, well, you got to get off this cross, go get baptized. You need to go do this. You need to go that. No, Jesus said, you know what? I promise you that today you're going to be with me in paradise. So see, it was really that simple because he saw his need and he recognized Jesus as being the only one that could meet his need. And his ministry was not very long and it, and it happened on a cross that the criminal, he, you know, the thief, he, he didn't get to come off the cross and go around and witness to people. He didn't get to go get baptized. He didn't get to go join a church. He, none of that. He was at the end of his life, but he found Jesus. And I believe that when, when we get to heaven, we can meet him because he's there. So if you've got questions, if you've got doubts, it's reaching out to him and seeing that Jesus is your only hope. It's not learning a seven point prayer and making sure you get everything in. It's not knowing the four spiritual laws. It's, it's not, I mean, all those things are tools to help us when we, when we give our life to Christ, but they are not what makes us saved. Only Jesus, the blood of Jesus saves us. And we don't have to understand it all. We don't have to know it all. But we confess him as Lord of our life. We look to him because only he can save. All right. I hope that makes some sense today. I've taken way too much of your time. If you stuck with me all the way to the end of this video, thank you. And I hope that this has touched you in some way. And um, if you haven't subscribed, yeah, I would love to have you subscribe share the videos, hit the thumbs up. If, you, if they mean anything to you, it helps me in the algorithms, which means um, YouTube will promote my video so that other people can see it. They'll, they'll put me out there and suggest me a little more. Leave comments, share the videos. Yeah, have I said it all? I don't know. I don't know. Hopefully, got it all there. All right, you guys have a great day. I'll talk to you tomorrow.